Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning from wherever you're dialing in from. Welcome back to Venture Capital TV and it's from La Token. My name is Sunny Mohanty. Today, I'm going to be hosting this episode of VCTV where we're going to discuss how to reach out to family offices for investments. So I'm also the regional director of, uh, of La Token based in Singapore. I'm been hosting shows Singapore Time. But today it's 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 a it's a different um, time zone. I'm very excited to talk about and host and discuss about family office investments. So let's have a quick round of introduction of the speakers today. And here you go. Hi, hi everybody. Welcome back. Welcome, welcome. So I'm on a different time zone, and still I'm very excited <laughs> as much as before. So I'm going to uh, start with uh, Frederick. Frederick, hi. I think we've spoken before, have we not? Absolutely. Yes, I've been on the, also the Singapore version. I'm usually on the, the US version normally, where I see Adrian and Gary all the time. So I am originally from Sweden. I do most of my business out of my London office. Uh, my experience linked to family offices is mainly to do exactly what it says to how to reach out to them how to work with them, and uh, I have aspiration to have a family office myself in due time, but not soon. Oh, wow, that's that's great. Okay, thank you. Next, I have Marin, and we are in the same time zone. It's 11 p.m. Hi, Marin. <laughs> uh, you're on mute. Okay, Marin, one second. Uh, let okay, me just now I have my audio on. Hello to everybody. So uh, I'm spearheading a family office in Schweitzer's gross capital arm here in Singapore. We are a dinosaur, as I like to say. So we are just two years younger than Siemens. We are older than Bosch and we are older than Continental. So our uh, roots go back to 1849. So that's quite some time. Uh, I am uh, keen on sharing my experience as an entrepreneur. I'm also a serial founder uh, with our audience today from the lens of a family office here in Southeast Asia, active uh, both in Europe and in Asia. So looking forward to a good talk tonight. Thank you so much, Marin, and welcome to VCTV. Okay, next I have Adrian. Hi, welcome back. How are you? Um, hello, Sony. Hello, everybody. Hello, La Token family. Uh, glad to be back as always. It's very entertaining uh, to be here and uh, educational in all direction possible between us, from us to, to the audience. Um, I'm Adrian Niculescu, second entrepreneur and investor. I actually work with few family offices in uh, uh, um, uh, financing startups and uh, two funds, actually. Uh, I'm involved directly in a uh, few big projects, CloudCoin Consortium. CloudCoin is a post-blockchain digital currency. DAO1, DAO1 is a decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, I'm also a mentor in the uh, Virgin Startups program in UK and also involved in, uh, in uh, other projects. Happy to be here today and contribute. Awesome. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks for being a part of this show today. Mm, last but not least, Gary Fowler. Hi, Gary. Good morning. Hi. Great Hello. to be here. Great to see uh, some familiar faces and some smiles from the past and the present. It's great. My name is Gary Fowler. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I love artificial intelligence, quantum computing, cybersecurity, crypto. I write a lot. My next article, by the way, coming out in Forbes, actually just get some, I just got some revisions. I'm writing about how to keep your loved ones alive forever using artificial intelligence. And uh, there are models out there, a replica. So these intelligent assistants that I talk about will, could take the form of a loved one, it, which will happen over time. Anyhow, um, so write a lot. I also have a couple of shows. I'm on the radio in New York City on iHeartRadio. Had the actress friend of mine on the Founders Report in La Token yesterday, which was really interesting because she looks like um, she's probably listening. So then if you're listening, you do look like Megan Fox. I don't care what anybody says. She really <laughs> looks like her. And she's an actress. Uh, so love artificial intelligence. I've done been involved in two unicorns. 
I was on the original management team at Click Software, sold to Salesforce for 1.35, and also EVA.ai. Um, have done NASDAQ listings, and uh, we help companies go global using Silicon Valley support from all over the world. And today we work in 24 countries. Thank you, Gary. Gary, I've seen the interview today. I, I think you are absolutely right. She looks like Megan Fox. She's like, it's amazing, yeah? <laughs> it was, it was. I was, it was shocked amazing. when I first saw her. I thought, is this some oh. kind of like prank show or something? <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Now that you said that, I was like, oh, yeah. A does. lot oh, like yeah. her, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction today. So it's about family offices. So family offices differ from other investors in a variety of ways, I would say, from being able to deploy patient capital and having flexible investment mandates to bringing specific operational and strategic expertise to portfolio companies. So like with other investors, obviously the pandemic COVID-19 has presented and continues to present unique and evolving challenges and opportunities for family offices. So unlike with other investors, the unique attributes of family offices provide unique opportunities to answer some of the challenges and opportunities. Um, so I would like to start with some, some questions to our, uh, our speakers today about family offices. Um, so let's just uh, let's just start with um, Marin, who is a family office herself. So, Marin, how to pitch um, to uh, to family offices? She's on mute, Sunny. Oh, again on mute again. Hello, I'm here. So. Um... I think uh, first, first of all, as uh, as a startup, as an entrepreneur, you need to look a little bit into what family office are you talking to. Is it a multi-family offices? Is it a single family offices? How much is the family office still having their own businesses? In what vertical are they active? And from there, prepare the pitch. So it's pretty much like uh, all early stage uh, uh, investments from uh, bootstrapping to crowdfunding to angel investors uh, looking how much is this family office an accelerator an incubator uh, can we get venture capital is it gross capital long-term capital or are there more uh, cvc corporate venture capital firm uh, i'll come to the points uh, later in the show sure. thank you thank you uh Marin. um so hi frederick um so you're planning to have your own family office. Um, so is that a particular reason why would you do that? So how do family offices invest in? Do they invest in funds or do they invest in startups, obviously? And how do they do that? So just like Marin just said there, it's very, very unique. So each and every one has got their own interest. And most of them have got a very long-term perspective. So it's more about preserving capital than actually creating massive, like, unicorns uh, so very much have that in mind and for most daughters i would say family office is not the best to work with because they, they might have very specific requirements having said all of that i do find uh, in the industry uh, family offices doing all sectors and they usually like to have a percentage of the whole portfolio towards uh, early stage, uh, even seed investments as well. But it very much varies. So how then to find out? Well, they often have an operations manager uh, and then they ha have a small team of analysts usually. Uh, and then there are other aspects which are not linked to investments, which I will not go into everything from like uh, transportation, security, etc. But everyone is a bit unique you can read quite a lot about family offices uh, both online and also on books you can find easily as well before you even start thinking about pitching them and adrian i know it's got we say the same thing how to pitch to others i leave all of that done to you adrian <laughs> right so let's just move to adrian next um i i, I would say that uh, there are no uh, two family offices alike because 
of course they have some uh, some some models but uh they are like like fashion brands you know they are unique because um uh usually the the the, the family behind uh is unique and usually has a history and before pitching um i would say to read a little bit about the history usually when you are dealing you are dealing as uh, frederick said with the team of uh, of uh, consultants i'm working with a london based uh, family office they have like 20 people uh, doing all the time research on investments huge team so uh, of course if you are fortunate enough you can meet the people behind it but usually at events uh, conferences so you have a lot of gatekeepers and it's very important the hook you are using to to catch the attention at the beginning so the conversation to continue not your let's say your email or your message to be to be totally uh, ignored they don't think necessarily like the regular VCs because are more conservative and um also as frederick said um for many businesses um are not are not the right partner because they have a very very strict due diligence which is um uh, even more in depth than um the regular vc companies are doing and usually uh, they they want more than just to put to put uh, to put money somewhere and are not very um, um, are, are not uh, how to say their their uh, risk profile is is low to medium you know because in as in any business the higher the risk the higher the reward but uh, they are more conservative than um, the uh, the other type of investor so when you are doing the pitch you need to 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 have this in mind and also to uh, calibrate your language and to to use some some uh, some some words which are not necessarily in the usual vc slang so uh, but it's it's a very interesting learning experience working with family offices and you can grasp a lot of uh, i don't know the um, uh, the way of doing things the rich the rich people are doing things in a certain way you know if you if you um if if, yeah. if i can be understood correctly on that right. you you learn a lot of life skills very sensitive skills which uh, can be thought in many other places. So it's a very rewarding experience. Mm, yes, how rich people work. Where do they invest? Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> Gary, over to you, please. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, so yeah, when I look at it, you know, I'm um, there's a lot of uh, where I am down in uh, Florida and Palm Beach, there's a lot of uh, ultra high net worth folks. I'm the poorest guy around, but there's a lot of <laughs> really interesting people that are my neighbors. And one of the things, it's kind of like a really close society. And there's a lot of uh, skepticism and I would say paranoia a bit, you know, leaving people. Once you come in, you're in because you're talking about people that are there to preserve uh, multi-generational wealth. They could be the third generation of the family and the idea is to preserve the wealth. So, but once you're in, it's a different world. It's a little bit different because what I find is they don't want to be inside of the business for the most part. They want to invest and trust is really important. Most of the time for family offices, I get referrals. It's one family office to another family office that does a referral. Uh, to be to give you that warm introduction, you know that basically vetting you coming in. But it's a it's it's um, they're really interested in artificial intelligence and they're really interested in quantum computing. I can tell you that across the board because each one of them has the pain. Their companies have the pain. They personally have the pain. So they're looking at these technologies can help their companies grow. They're looking at 
uh, technologies that can help their uh, family offices attain the kind of um, returns that they need. So they're aggressive right now. And I see them from Africa um, through Europe to the U.S. I mean, they're active everywhere uh, today. And in terms of the VC firms, you know, the look at Venrock. It was founded by the Rockefeller family. So and if you look at Apple and you start to peel it back a bit, not to be facetious, but you'll see that their family offices were involved in Apple, most of the successful companies. It's unbelievable, actually. So that's it. So the challenge is it's hard to get in and you can get directories to talk about family offices, but it's really hard to get to them. You've got to have a warm introduction to get in. And once you're in, you're in this kind of secret society. And it's um, it's interesting. You got to be a little bit careful sometimes because you'll see groups out there that purport to um, uh, do introductions to family offices. You just you want to make sure you understand their track record that they're successful because sometimes there's a lot of uh, BS. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know what else to say. You know, I'm a country boy. If, if, if it's black and white and have horns, it's a cow. If it's BS, it's BS. There's a lot of BS out there. Of course. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thanks a lot. Okay. So, so family offices, I understand today, um, they want to invest directly, right? Uh, rather than participate in blind pools. Um, they take what I've, my experience is they take selective bets with the deal to gain in-depth understanding, right? So I've been working with uh, people in the space as well. So that's how it is. Um, you know, that's what uh, my experience has been telling me that every family office now wants to leverage their core expertise of building business from the ground up and forging a network of connections to help their portfolio. So I just want to know the impact of the COVID-19 the pandemic on the current family office investments and their investment pipeline. How has this pandemic affected them? Because everybody's got affected. And so are they? I'm going to start with maybe Frederick with this one. Is that okay? Yeah, that's perfectly fine. I would say in the pandemic, most rich people have got richer just yes, because of the simple fact that we're printing money. So all assets, and if you are fairly rich, you do actually focus more on assets than on actually money. That means that they have got more money than ever to invest. Uh, so, so with that little dilemma, uh, how can you invest safely in COVID times and how will you find and cherry pick companies which actually will not only sustain but also thrive in this uh, crazy new world we actually do live in so yeah just like all of my own investments uh, i find there is a risk reward thing that everyone is thinking about all the time and my interaction with most family offices they like to have very very low risk but they like to have very high reward in proportion to yeah. risk so that means that actually family office demands, uh, from my experience, in mainly in real estate and fintech, uh, they are more challenging many times even than venture capitalists. But right. they can also have the portfolio view that your company really fits in to the group, the portfolio of companies, other assets. So you can actually get a, a very nice leverage more than the actual money if you uh, gain a good cooperation with them. I think great points there, uh, Frederick. Thank you so much. Uh, Marin, I would like to go next with you. Uh, well, anyway, uh, just to comment on money. Money is a commodity. That's not a differentiator at all. Uh, uh, if you are a VC uh, or a CVC or family office, you also need to be attractive, have your own value proposition for your portfolio companies to attract uh, the best entrepreneurs, the best problem solvers. Uh, out there in the market. So it's not only a one way. Uh, I wouldn't want to agree that family offices are more risk averse. It really depends on the focus and the scope of family offices. So to your question, what did we do at the beginning of the pandemic? We had invested in 30 plus companies uh, pre-COVID uh, pre since 2017 here in Southeast Asia from C to Series A. So uh, we pushed the brake pedal a little with the rational uh, to keep our funds available 
for our existing portfolio companies to do bridge financing uh, if required, to be there as a helping hand, not only on the money side, as I just mentioned, but also on the management side. So uh, we have seen a couple of our founders that have really encountered the first big hit. They've not had their company during the financial crisis or uh, the bubble before. So they've been on pretty good track and then the big hit, the complete reset. So it's been emotional stability that is important for us. Management capacities, also helping them to uh, reduce their work count and uh, work, uh, their, their talent base and place, uh, uh, place their talent somewhere else in our portfolio companies as well as money for bridging. So that's been our approach to it. But meanwhile, uh, we are at two X to speed pre-COVID. That's great. That's great. I mean, then they need. We all need that emotional support during this uh, crisis. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Marin. Um, I'm going to next move to Gary Fowler. What was the question, Sonny? Gary, you are on mute. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. So the impact of the pandemic on on the family office investments and their pipeline for the next uh, couple of next couple of years well you know the family offices are smart of doing just like uh, maron's doing they get online and use it to their advantage to be able to scout for companies and partnerships and those kind of things but they're not all doing that you know some of them are more interested in doing social get uh gatherings you know with with uh uh, society hour rather than get out there and really get their fingers uh, fingernails dirty. So it's the ones that utilize the medium wisely are really moving ahead. And the ones that look at these, as I said earlier, some of these emerging technologies like AI, cybersecurity and quantum computing. I mean, they're going to affect those companies in a really bad way if they don't do something about it, if they don't understand how to deal with data. Data is if you look at where we are, I mean, look at what value each one of us has. It's a data. If you look at the value of the corporation, it's in the data now. Of course, there's manufacturing, et cetera, but the data is really important. How do you gain a competitive advantage? How do you be able to serve your customers better? How do you be able to develop uh, different types of partnerships better? It's in the data. So that's where we feel that there's a great thrust that the family offices and the venture capitalists need to focus on. Yes, they're doing it. It's not just about, you know, we talk about AI, but I'm talking about machine learning, empathy, compassion, unsupervised artificial intelligence, semi-supervised, but actually really solving a problem, not about algorithmic math, but actually solving a very serious problem. Look at the supply chain we talk about. We've talked about many times and, and uh, the not being transparent during COVID. And I'm not going to talk about the toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> People are buying toilet paper again here in Florida, by the way. Again? Again? Yeah, because it's a pa hospitals are packed in Central Florida again with Delta virus. Yeah, oh it's unbelievable. Goodness. So uh, Delta, Lambda, and Iota. We had a rap concert here at, the, um, at a local establishment and half of the employees got sick from COVID. It's, I mean, it's unbelievable, actually. But anyhow, we, but the good news is we have these online opportunities to be able to still reach other people, to be able to, to ex extend our reach globally. Those family offices who use that medium, Zoom, um, they're using StreamYard, as we are here today, Wirecast, those kind of mediums to get the word out. And, you know, you need to make sure companies that are listening, make sure you have an online presence and you're writing a lot and you're doing videos and you're talking about your successes and you're talking about your company because every time somebody sets up a meeting with you on a, a Zoom, they're going to Google your name as soon as they get on that call and they're going to check in your LinkedIn profile because they're not going to remember all the things about you and they want to make sure they're, they're precise. So make sure you update your information. Absolutely. Absolutely. Totally agree. Thank you so much, Gary. Sure. Adrian, over to you, please. Um, in times of crisis, usually the richer get richer. The, the rich get richer. And the smart, get, the smart rich get even richer. And this is 
not necessarily only to the fact that um, there is money printed, but usually um, um, there is a small percent, like 2% of the people, including many family offices uh, owners, knowing things that the rest of the population don't know. They have access to resources, networking, deals, and information is even more important than money because you need to know where where you invest. So um, the digital transformation affected the way family offices communicate more than ever, which, which is a good thing. And also, regarding the inclusion aspect, I believe that through the digital means, more entrepreneurs uh, have access to uh, this special category of investors. And also, we see many family offices at the first generation because many very successful entrepreneurs, after they make uh, a huge exit, they create a family office. So, which was not in the tradition of their family, but that tradition is starting now. So uh, it, it's a very interesting uh, segment to study and to have the chance to cooperate with. But the main conclusion is that with COVID, they are doing better than ever before. That's good. That's very good. All right. Uh, I think, uh, thank you so much for sharing those uh, insights. Um, so when it comes to deal flows, um, so while a deal flow can be generated from several sources, the proposals that are likely to garner the most attention are the ones from companies or startup founders, entrepreneurs, where, where, where a previous investment has been successful, right? or there is a solid existing relationship with other family offices. Unsolicited proposals from untried startup founders are likely to be given short shrift by most established investors. So we know we speak about relationships, right? And it's very much like, you know, a family office referring another family office. It's always, that's how the deal flow works. So how what are the different ways these family offices are revising and rethinking investment and portfolio risk and how they're balancing their strategies right now um i'd like to go with frederick again if that's okay yeah that's fine uh, i'll just keep to the very fundamental basics which is the whole communication aspect. i've got a book in my bookshelf i wrote a couple of years ago which is Trust is the new currency. Trust is very much what we're trading and talking about here. So if you have zero impact, zero relationship, zero anything, people do exactly what Gary said. If even that, they might Google you to do anything or you might not even have the chance. So we have spoken about other investments than family offices. So the unsolicited approach, just like connect to LinkedIn and then drop a pitch deck, you need to do slightly more than that to yeah. even uh, have any uh, traction at all, in my point of view. So most of them do get unsolicited things, but many of them are having a, a more active approach where they now can use, uh, for example, Zoom just to, to filter uh, things, etc., etc. So yeah, uh, th those are super general, <laughs> holistic things, but the, yeah. the relationship warmer introductions uh, any right. kind of usual sales logic uh, and relationship logic really applies more than yeah. ever in this case as well i think you're right yeah totally warm introduction relationships thank you so much uh, frederick uh um marin would you like to add on to that i think there are various avenues uh, to combine uh, uh, as a family office so the more it's to the core business. The more you might want to rely on your own existing brand and just go on a selection and risk assessment because your uh, inbound deal flow is that solid that you don't need to go on marketing costs or sales. Uh, the more it's away 
from uh, from the core business, the more that calls for partnerships, from my opinion. And that could be being an LP of an existing fund who has traction in a certain vertical or, or region, or tapping on other family offices while joining them in syndicate deals. So it's both worlds. But what I believe that each family office, and that might be a little bit new these days, especially with uh, digitization is, you need to build your own brand. That resonates what we've heard from Gary. You need to be out in the market, tell your story, be updated. So the fully undercover family office might not get the best deals uh, out in the market down the road. Uh, yeah, undercover. Thank you so much. Uh, Gary, your thoughts, please. Hold on. What was the question? Sorry about that. So it was about um, rethinking, uh, revising investment strategies, um, portfolio risk balancing strategies. So h h what are family offices doing in this space? Well, I mean, that's part of, you know, maintaining your, uh, I mean, Marin does it every day, right? It's, you got to look at where there's risk, where there's opportunity. You got to, you know, one of the things to look at is, does a company generate revenue and how much? What's the growth that they project over the next, you know, three years? Um, do you like the team? You know, it's the simple kind of, whenever you make an investment, do you like the team? Do they have the right product at the right place at the right time? Are they leaders or followers? Uh, where are they set up? What's the valuation? Is it a good deal or not? Do they want too much for the, uh, is their valuation too high? I mean, just a simple kind of things at the same time, you know, part of what, what happens, Sonny, it's like, um, five, nine, right? The, um, the founder of five, nine, they sold the company for 14.7 billion. And I had them on my show recently. We had a deep discussion about it and, he started in his apartment in San Francisco and people didn't believe in him in 2008. I mean, it's, do you really believe it, that that entrepreneur is passionate about what they have and, and how are they dominating the space? Look at WhatsApp, right? That happened with uh, Jan Koons. So, you know, part of it's that. The other part is there's a lot happening in the market today from all parts of the world. I mean, we just had a company that was sold two weeks ago. And, you know, we're mining company. We're looking for companies all over Africa. We're looking for companies uh, all over the world and places other people aren't. We need to do that more. On one side, it's about creating opportunity so people can help their families. But I'm not talking about entitlement. I'm talking about opportunities because on the other side, you know, these are companies that are ready in some instances ready to go global. And at the same time, not a lot of people hear of them. So go where I remember Scott McNeely, the founder of Sun Microsystems. I had lunch with him out in California. I know him. And he said, you know, one of the things in life it, to be successful as an entrepreneur is go to the places that you fear the most because you're going to learn the most and you're going to find the greatest opportunity. And I've used that for many, many years. And I told him two years ago when I had lunch with him again about it, but it's true. You got to go to places where other people aren't. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Gary, for that, uh, for those insights. I think next we have Adrian. A warm introduction, which is also accompanied by uh, uh, framing, uh, by framing, I understand, okay, when I recommend you, I, I also make an introduction to position you in a, in a certain way, help a lot because um, in many occasions you can find family offices in, in closed clubs, but um, there is other thing which could work called persistence. So I will advise anybody if they have a good project, a solid idea with a great potential, uh, not to be afraid to do a cold pitch. Um, you can search a lot of information on Google and you can find the key persons or you can ask other people to find out the correct contacts and to pitch no matter if everybody else is doing that okay, if you will send something, they will ignore you. 
you need to be recommended by by somebody. So your your focus has to be on the quality of what you are doing, and after that, don't be afraid to to call pitch. And sometimes doing uh, call okay. pitching is very um, uh, uh, it comes with a lot of uh, uncertainty, even some fears, and it's freaking uncomfortable for most of the people. But as Gary said, when you do things you are not comfortable with or when you are doing uh, things uh, you have uh, uh, fears around, you are able to grow and to learn a lot of things. And I don't know, maybe the law of attraction will, will get you the... Um, the, the the best family office for <laughs> your business. So don't don't be shy. <laughs> okay, cold pitching, Frederick. Yeah, uh, I'll share with with the world uh, something I don't talk about all the time. I used to be in special forces as an officer, and later oh, wow. intelligence service. So think about guerrilla marketing think about doing unusual things to yeah. build on what adrian said that how can you get in front of a person i mean i have used this to to, to get in front of people who are never should have met uh, otherwise uh, creating uh, a meeting or do whatever it takes to get to the to the top man and avoid all the gatekeepers you will probably be way more interesting than many other people by just that approach in itself Right. Thank you. Thank you. So be brave. Don't be afraid of anything. So that's the takeaway. Um, oh, sorry. One second. I'm just trying to put myself. Okay. So the so family offices which are active in the startup space are usually very sophisticated, right? We agree. With lots of connection, knowledge, and investment capabilities to nurture these risky assets. A good question. Where do I find them? I mean, besides VCTV, where can I find these family offices? <laughs> Frederick. All right. I got the honor to go first again. All right. They need to adjust my position and think about the answers. <laughs> where to find them? Well, uh, number one, most of family offices are founded by families who've got like ballpark 100 million uh, and upwards into the billions. So, who are they? It's quite easy to find the billionaires on paper, uh, but how to find them? Uh, there are clubs, there are communities, there are events. Uh, there are, for example, if you think about like a, a fundraising events, there are places where they like to be. They ask the, the main people behind the family office. But uh, it is set up, the family office, often with a purpose. There is an underlying very big asset. So it might be, uh, for example, many other Swedish strong companies might take H&M as, as an example, because I know they've got a family office. They have an underlying asset, but then in terms of where should we invest all of the other money? That's a specialist knowledge. So the specialist knowledge is usually not the founding member of the family office. It's usually a team that is doing the investment part of things. So that is roughly Great. an answer. Great points, great points there. I think next I'll, I'd like to know Gary. Gary meets a lot of high net worth individuals. Gary, besides VCTV, what do you find them? Well, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm like Forrest Gump. I, I bought the smallest house in Palm Beach, like literally the smallest place at the Polo Club. And so a lot of these people do equestrian sports in the wintertime. And I see them in the restaurants. I see them, you know, I don't want to name names, but literally some of the wealthiest people on the planet and you become friends with them. You start laughing and doing things and, and hanging out and the word gets around. What do you do for a living? Well, I'm into artificial. Intelligence. I've seen them by the way. Some of the, I was at a uh, dinner at the equestrian. So we have a, a VIP lounge at the equestrian um, polo club here. And I happened to be there and I saw one of these <laughs> people Google my name. And it was really funny to watch this, person that's really famous google in your name at dinner <laughs> and i was like i was like i was smiling i had a couple of drinks so i was probably smiling a little bit too much but i was smiling because here's a person why in the world would they like you know would you'd never think they would do it but they do and so 
one of the things that I did, and he may be watching today, is I got one of the top horse brokers in the world to be on the board of my company. He sells his horses to some of the wealthiest people in the world. They're his friends. So, I mean, you need to have a, a good introduction. So put yourself as, uh, who was it, Adrian, you know, the law of attraction. Put yourself out there and be careful what you ask for because you're going to find it. Right. Thank you so much, Gary. Thanks a lot. Okay. Marin, Dr. Marin, do you have this private closed door events where only family offices are meeting for other family offices? But, you know, obviously you came on VCTV, we got access to you. But otherwise, if there was no VCTV, how would you reach out to the startups or how would these startups reach out to you? You are on mute again, I guess. So here I am. So you only need to know one family office, right? Because if you are in the club, you can just uh, leverage your credibility if you did business with one. That's how it works, basically. But certainly what Gary said is right. Uh, I suggest run a systematic approach. Uh, look at the company registries uh, uh, for capital inflow, the new ones that have been founded. Uh, in the registries, you might... Uh, be able to figure out if it's a family office, a holding company, also false. And then from there, you go and reach out and hang around in the places where family offices hang around. So that might be yacht clubs, that might be polo clubs, that might be golf clubs, that might be just interesting events. Don't don't right. forget don't forget charity too. Right. Got it. Great, thank you so much. I'm just a little conscious of the time because we've got somebody who is going to um, share his um, um, sort of uh, uh, presentation. He's going to present his project. So Gregory, uh, before uh, you know, start presenting, a quick uh, introduction about yourself. And please try to keep the presentation to five to eight minutes. We are going to circulate the pitch deck after the um, after the session. We're going to, I'm going to email each of the investors today and the speakers here your pitch deck, try to keep it uh, to the point uh, and short. Uh, over to you. I'm going to share your presentation as well. Gregory, over to you, please. Okay, thank you very much for your great advices. Uh, unfortunately, I did not have uh, these advices before I did my pitch, but it, that's okay. Uh, let me uh, introduce myself very quickly. Um, I'm French and I'm living in Belgium. I'm involved in a culture and festival uh, uh, during uh, ten, the 10 uh, uh, past years. And now uh, we created a new token a revolution token uh, to um, would be change the the industry of the beverage all over the world. So let me share my, my screen. Up. Yeah, it's, it's a everybody see that? Yes, we see that. Okay, so let me introduce the Selva uh, company with the SBA token, which uh, revolutionized the the uh, beverage world uh, industry. So. First of all, I would like to show you a, a little bit quick video to understand how the cell bar machine works. So it's a beverage machine who works with the cryptocurrency. This is uh, the, the current problem we meet in the in the industry. For the, the customers, there is a lot of uh, waiting time in the queue in the file to have a, the, a drink. Uh, bar and pub loss of money due to the theft and waste because a, a lot of barmaid used to, to pour next to the glass before to, to put inside the glass. It's around uh, an average of 25% uh, wasted in the, in Belgium. So providers have a 70% late payment of invoices from bar and pub. 
and manufacturers have a logistic and after sales service problem. The self-bound uh, system resolve all this problem and we resolve also uh, many more, but this is the, the main ones. Uh, how it works, we, we don't sell the machine, we uh, uh, give it for free, it's available for free of charge, and we just uh, graft on the, the, the industry. So we actually we already work with DIV equipment in Antoine Belgium. We have the manufacturers of the, the beer pump in France, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Netherlands. So we already have the market because we solved all the problems they have. And they in um, in country, and they give us all the the portfolio clientele for free, so they uh, enable to build and install uh, 100 machine per month for now. But the target is to have uh, 50 manufacturers like them, uh, enable to to build and install 40 machine per month. So around uh, 20,000 machine uh, per month in Europe, Africa, and different continents. And because uh, we are a very good client, uh, we strongly increase their sale and service, and also we offer tools that optimize the logistic. So the the cashless payment system is enabled in every uh, in every country because it works with the SBAR token. Though so this token allows the cashless payment with a smart contract integrated. At the moment, the the customers uh, paid is uh, is beverage centiliter by centiliter is debit, debited from his card and the establishment, the provided cell bar and the maintenance are created in the same time, in real time, uh, because of the, the blockchain and the smart contract uh, technology and cell bar take 17% uh, on every table turnover. And to supply customers with S bar token, cell bar company uh, machine we buy, uh, will buy token on the crypto market. So we can say uh, like the consumption inductor, indirectly, uh, sorry, indirectly trigger the purchase order and the machine cell bar play the role as the market maker on, on, the, on the crypto uh, currency uh, market. So S bar is a, is a new generation token the value of the token is supported by the turnover of the machine. is is not exactly indexed, but is something like this. So it's uh, supported by the the sale of the beverage, the sale of the big data collected by the machine, because our machine collect big data on on festival, on stadium, and we sell this big data to the the drink brand like Coca Cola Company, Heineken, or Abin Bev Company. And also we have to aware by the logistics support of the beverage industry. So S bar is like a drink busher with a constant increased value. Uh, let's have a look with the beer market, uh, exa for example. This is the, the world market of the beer. They have uh, more than uh, 566 uh, th that represent more than 2 million machines for them. If we only have 1% of this market, that represent more than uh, 100 million turnover per month, okay? And this is just for the beer, but our machine could work with soda, soft wines, juice, coffee, tea, uh, uh, water, or every beverages, okay? More we have machines, more the value uh, of the S-bar token will increase because it's, there is a correlation. So for the next year, uh, we plan to have uh, one drill machine first. Um, and the, the S-bar will be increased at $5 at the moment. You can buy it in the private ICO for uh, 70 uh, cents, okay? And uh, it will be listed on that token next week for one euro and a half, okay? And on year two, we plan to have uh, 20K machines all over the world with a, a token value at $20 and it will increase uh, higher and higher uh, every year, okay? So thank you for, for your attention. I, I hope I, I, I have a, I, I will be clear. Yeah. And uh, if you have questions, I'm here. Thank you so much, uh, Gregory. That was quick. Thank you so much. I think it's a very good cashless, sorry, barless self bar. Um, so, any questions, uh, Frederick? Main question uh, is are you looking for people to invest in the actual new tokens or into the actual business? Two slightly different questions. In fact, we have the, the two solutions. We have a private ICO if you want to buy the, the S-Bar token. 
And if you want to do also the, to invest in equity, it's possible we create also an STO. So it's a security token offer to invest if the Bars Eco company, which is the, the company sister of the of Selva. So what I, uh, Gregory, what he means that if you want to uh, invest in those machines that you manufacture? Not exactly. The, the manufacturers are, are, are working for them and we pay the machine and they, they give us all the clients because our system is, uh, is better for them in the after sales service and logistic. And so it's a very uh, uh, practical for them. So uh, normally when we have manufacturers for the AV equipment, for example, in France, you can install uh, more than 20, uh, 2,000 machine per year for them, for free. So what are you raising funds for? Sorry, I'm a little curious because I'd like the business model, but still un unable to understand it correctly. So what are you raising funds for? Uh, we we are looking for 2 million uh, euro at the moment. For? 2 million euro. Yeah, yeah. So these fun funds are going to be deployed where? It's deployed to, to uh, buy new machines and also to... Uh, to buy some SBAR token on the, the, the cryptocurrency market to make the market maker because the, the consumption is a, is a utility token. Without this token, we can buy the, the, the consumption. So basically, we want to have more employees to have more, uh, to have more manufacturers all over the world and also to buy some machines. But we already have the ENG, so is ING Bank to follow them for the, the financement of the, the the building machine construction, the building machine. Any questions from anyone else? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Gregory, thanks a lot for sharing your uh, your concept with us. So, uh, as you mentioned just uh, before, you intend to raise two million. Uh, at what valuation are you doing that? For what, are, first question, what valuation? Secondly, what do you want to spend the money for? Beside, mm -hmm. beside being the market maker. This oh, one I understood. Yeah, okay. And how did, you, how did you finance yourself until today? For the moment, we already uh, raised uh, three, uh, three million token by just private investors. So it's just uh, friends and, uh, and family. Uh, and uh, now there is a 2 million token left. Uh, the valuation of the, the company uh, for the moment is uh, just uh, 10 million, but it's just the beginning because uh, at the March, the next March, we build uh, new machines and we, we will have new uh, markets like uh, Germany, also Africa. We are also in discussion with Africa. And I think when we will be have more uh, territories to install our machines, the, the valuation of the, the the company will be updated for sure. And the, the, the money is spent just on the machine priority in, to build new machine and to have employees to uh, to form, to, to, to train manufacturers to, uh, to how to use our system. And it's really something really easy. You just have to plug in our system on the machine who, who already exists. Uh, yeah, what kind of uh, recurrent revenue model do you have in mind? Or do you already have recurrent revenues via subscriptions or others? No, uh, our, our revenue model is uh, to take uh, um, a fees of the, the, con the consumption. We take 70% uh, of the, the, the consumption of the, the the beverages of the machine and also we sell big data the uh, our, comp our machine has collected big data and uh, i can i can uh, come to see a uh, coca-cola company and say uh, uh, i have habit consumption uh, on the festival for example and uh, it's better for you to sell the the the, the coca-cola uh, with uh, more pressure with the uh, temperature colder and I have the, the number as the, the file on the data to, to have it, and I can sell it to them. So it's also a, a big cherry, like we say in, in Belgium, big cherry on the case. And the, the, the target for them is to have 50 manufacturers all over the world. And I think the valuation of the, of the company 
as when we have that, it's uh, one million. So we the target is to be unicorn, eh? clearly. We have oh, that's good. Market. That's good. That's good. Any other questions from anybody else? <clears throat> I have a question, uh, Gregory. First, thank you for the presentation. Um, the main hook of uh, of uh, the project, as I saw it, is is that allows the suppliers to be paid very fast, which is very important. In real time, yeah. I'm asking, yeah, yeah. I'm asking if you if you feel that having your own token is mandatory or not, because it it uh, it it adds a little bit of a hurdle for the clients, for the buyers, and usually these are uh, casual buyers. Mm -hmm. Not uh, all of them are tech savvy, so it's a little bit complicated. They need to purchase your token and make the payments i would that's, have yeah, that's seen a good question very yeah, yeah i would have seen a, a very good uh use case to allow people let's say to pay i don't know by card or even crypto and in the back end using blockchain or anything else to make this 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 faster distribution of funds Mm -hmm. um, without necessarily having your own token. Of course, both versions uh, could work. But my question is, if you think that it's mandatory to have your own token or not? So it's a very relevant question, Adrian. Um, actually, uh, we just, we're talking about the token with investors. With uh, our clients, like uh, pub and restaurant, we're not talking about that because they are afraid about the cryptocurrency. For them, uh, the, the cryptocurrency is just, uh, we talk sometimes about blockchain, but it's just the technology behind the, the service and the customer experience. Just the judge wants to, to see the payments, it's uh, made in real time. So when they have the, the app, Selvar app on the, the, the smartphone, they see the, the phone coming in real time in the wallet. And they don't want to know if they have a cryptocurrency, a cryptocurrency behind this. They say, okay, it's working, okay? For example, in, in Turkey, it's uh, the, the government uh, forbidden the payment with cryptocurrencies. And if we have the market in Turkey, uh, we won't talk about this. People will uh, pay with the fiat uh, currency of the, the, the Turkish, but uh, they, they wouldn't know they have a crypto uh, behind this, just for the technology. Just the technology because it allows smart contract who pay to do the breakdown in the real time. And, and uh, about, the, about the monetary, you... we, we are working with the, with the lawyers and uh, as, at the moment he's working with uh, his colleagues to have a, a mandatory of the financial authority in Belgium. So I think in January, uh, we will be enabled to, to talk in public about the, uh, our token to uh, if you want, people want to, to purchase it. At the moment, we, I can do this on, also in private. I can do this uh, just in private, but uh, in January, I think we will be allowed to do it in public with the mandatory of the financial authority in Belgium. And another question is regarding the machines. If you have like any, any patent regarding the machines, the business model, or something like that, any intellectual property, or is just a white label, a white labeled machine with with your uh, logo on it. So uh, I'm, I'm I was asking from the competition perspective, how mm -hmm. uh, duplicable is this business? You know. So we have just a white label at the moment because the, the creator uses uh, the blockchain, he combines blockchain, IA, IoT, big data and uh, automation in the same time. And he push the technology very far in the same time. And he's, he, uh, he's not uh, working with uh, Linux or Windows, it's his own technology. And he already have the market because the, the machine uh, already exists uh, for the next uh, 10 past uh, the, the 10 uh, next years but now we just update the machine with the uh, blockchain and if we want to be a competitor 
I say good luck because you need to have the network, you need to have the technology, and you need also to have the market. And we have the, the three of us. Okay, any other questions, please? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your intention. Thank okay, you great. For your I, thank you so much, uh, Gregory, for your uh, speech today. I think we we all liked your, I liked your project. I think obviously everybody's intrigued. I haven't seen uh, a startup in this space using cryptocurrencies where the users really do not know that the cryptocurrency is there. So, which is good. Thank you so much. Uh, let's just quickly uh, take some closing remarks. Uh, where can people find you, Marin? Uh, type my name uh, and Google me, uh, LinkedIn me, or just type uh, the web page you just see there. Uh, you can also upload your pitch deck uh, uh, if you want to share your thoughts with us, and then we'll we'll take it from there. We are a small team. We are very fast. Happy to be here, and maybe we are just your first door to family office world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Frederick, where can people find you? On LinkedIn. That's the easiest way to find me. Oh, that's the only place, not VCTV? <laughs> um, I'm more, I'm more, well, I, I'm here all the time anyway. <laughs> <laughs> on VCTV Thank as well. you. Thanks a lot. Um, Adrian. Um, besides VCTV, of course, and, uh, and uh, LinkedIn, um, all my social media accounts are adrianiculescu.com, so it's, it's very easy to, to reach me, plus, uh, of course, the, the domain. I'm, um, I'm answering to all messages, not all the time, I'm very fast. Happy to help in uh, any way I can, and of course, to come back into the family at VCTV, which is a very, very important educational uh, initiative. I'm happy to, to support any anytime. Thank you so much, uh, Adrian. Gregory, I'm going to send your pitch deck to all the speakers uh, to, of the panel today. I, the congratulations and all the best for your uh, listing, which is coming up soon on Token. So thank you so much, uh, Frederick, Adrian, Dr. Marain, and Gregory, and Gary, who has had to go for another meeting for your uh, participation today. I hope to see you again on another episode. Till then, good night from Singapore, and keep smiling. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.